Hello, everybody. Today we're here with Susan McCleary. I'm going to say hi. <laughs> hi, everybody. Sue just released her new book, and I'm super excited to share that with you guys. Um, we'll probably have a little, maybe a little contest um, announcement too. So if you guys maybe want to want a copy of this, um, I will send it to you. <laughs> um, or Sue and I can chat about what how that works out. But how are things? How have you been? Good. Yeah, I'm. Um... I'm gearing up for spring workshop travel. So that's kind of where my head is right now. Um, yeah. Headed to Seoul, South Korea on Friday. That's um, exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I've never been. And um, I'm teaching for a really great school that I've followed for a long time. And this is mm -hmm. rescheduled from 2020. So. <laughs> yeah. There's still some of those lingering little bits from you know, 2020. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's photo so field. I, I did see you at symposium, but like before that we were at, um, the trend summit and that's when like everything shut down and we oh. haven't really been able to see each other like since, um, well, I saw you in July, but right. <laughs> other than that, it's been nuts trying to catch up. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited about the spring and that's kind of where my head's just kind of, you know, um, thinking about all the things that I'm going to be talking about and, yeah. Trying to plan, trying to be organized. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I know it sneaks up really quick. I can't believe it's already March. I don't, I don't know where it went. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Very mm -hmm. Um, so about this, the workshop in Seoul, is that, um, something that anybody can go to or is it strictly for the school? Yeah. So, um, the school is Sasson Fleury and I've followed them for years and noticed that, um, the owner just took, brings in teachers from all over the, the world. Um, That's really cool. Yeah. And so in 2020, I was supposed to go to South Korea with my family because we've always had an interest um, to go. And I reached out to her and I said, we're going to be there anyway. Um, and she said, we should do a workshop. And so that's how the ball started that's awesome. rolling. Yeah. Um, but she, yeah, she hosts international teachers and then she also teaches quite a bit herself. And mm -hmm. she said most of her students are um, South Korean um, retail florists, but there's some event florists too who are interested and who, you know, frequent her classes. Um, and then for this workshop, I think we have a few from out of the country, but most people are, are local. Local. Yeah. So do you have to have a translator for that? Is that going to be? No. <laughs> <laughs> I always worry about that. I'm like, I hope they can understand. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. So just so speaks really great English. So I'm sure I have. Yeah. That, that's helpful. Yeah. She's had other English speaking um, teachers that I've, I've followed. So I think I've that's great. <laughs> I'll have to go look up that school. I think that uh, I'm sure I probably already follow them, but it sounds like it's a really great, great opportunity. Um, are you going to bring the family or is it still a family vacation too? No, it's <laughs> no, I mean, everything changed, you know, and mm -hmm. It, the travel's quite expensive right now to South Korea. Yeah. So just financially, it didn't make sense to bring the whole clan this time. Yeah. So we have the same thing kind of going on. I actually, I've, we had planned to go to Japan in 2020. And so it's kind of the same situation, but we are, it's, it's more of a family trip and I'm going to try and sneak away and do some flower stuff like early in the morning, but uh, it's yeah, I understand it's expensive. Yeah. I just booked everybody to go to Japan for October. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Are are you going to yeah. Tokyo? Yeah, so we're gonna hit a few different places. So yeah, Tokyo's on the list. And the flower market. Yeah. Is it the flower market? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's where I'm gonna I'm gonna sneak away early. I'm gonna have to talk to you about that. We'll sidebar about that later. <laughs> I need to know where to go. I'm like I need to reach out and make some connections on that because I, I do wanna go. What you're making the trip, so I might as well go see stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Any more travel coming up? What do you, uh, what else you got going on? Yeah. There's a little flurry of activity in the spring. So when I get back, I have about 10 days and then I go for my second, um, installment of the Borma school. That's right. Yes. I'm so excited for you guys. That's going to be so much fun. I, I really, really wanted to do it. I just, it was not in the cards last year. <laughs> yeah. It's a time commitment for sure. Um, so mm -hmm. 12 days in November, this is the International Master Floristry Training with Gregor Lersch. At, yeah, the IMF. Right, at the Borma Institute. So we had 12 days in November, um, a break 
with some homework and study. And then we go back for just under 12 days, I think, again, um, in March. So I have to do mm-hmm. that. And then there's the testing process and so on um, that happens. And then um, in April, I have a workshop in Scottsdale. A really cool. Very cool. Um, and there's still a few spots left for that. And then in May, I'll be in Nantucket. See, I'm trying to remember. I have to look. <laughs> Your calendar. I know. It's hard. <laughs> like access the dates. Um, so Nantucket in May. And then um, late May, I'll be in uh, Maryland with Grateful Gardener. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yes. I saw that was announced. That looks really fun. I, I, I really, I love them so much. I need to, I need to reach out to them. I know they want to do more podcasts and stuff. So maybe I'll, I'll hit them up next. Yeah. Yeah. um, Aquaponics system is fascinating. And I feel like they're really pioneering something that could transform, um, you know, the floriculture world here. Yeah. Pretty awesome. And then there's one more in June. This is an exciting one. This is a benefit workshop in Chicago with Azrae Garden. Uh, oh, wow. For their Black Forest Fund um, sponsorship program. Mm-hmm. So that's a, a fundraising workshop, which I really haven't done before, I don't think, where all of the funds go to um, this really great cause. So much more will be coming out. I'll be yeah, trying that sounds to awesome. Letter and let people know in plenty of time about everything that's happening, but some good things. Yeah. Right, that's awesome. I'm 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 impressed that you can remember that whole calendar just off the top of your head. It's a lot. I'm trying. I'm I'm not a naturally organized person, so I really have to try. So every yeah, I like okay, remember, remember. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Very cool. Are you coming to symposium this year? Or are you? Definitely. I uh, okay. Yes. Well, cool. I'm like, I might, I kind of just want to go to see the friends and the people. Um, I'm not going to be as much behind the scenes. I'm actually, I'm not on the committee anymore. I'm done. I'm like, maybe we'll just go for funsies this time. Yeah. Well, I've always wanted to see Ellie Lynn. Uh, yes. When I see yeah. her name and then Pear, I mean, I love Pear Benjamin too. And I love David Beam. I've always loved. Him. Yeah. So I think. Yeah, I'm excited just to see those three. And I thought about volunteering, like reaching out and seeing if I could help. But I really enjoyed going and enjoying everything. Yeah, I was going to say, you won't see the outside of that back room if you volunteer. I mean, it's a really good experience. But for somebody like you, I think you'd probably rather just be well on the end where you just sit and enjoy. There's a ton to learn and a ton to see, no matter yeah. how long. Very true. That's for sure. But yeah, it's great just to like walk around and take in all the good sites. Yep. Yep. Anna Heat and I'll be there. We're, we're rooming together. So we'll, we'll definitely see you there. <laughs> okay. So let's kind of switch gears. Um, do you want to talk about what's going on with the book? Yeah. How do you feel about that? Sure. So um, I have a new book. It's called Flowers for All. It came out the first week of February. Um, mm-hmm. A little tiny baby book. It's not. I like. I really like the size. I was yeah. very like. Oh, it's not huge. It's nice. It's not like. Yeah. Gigantic. No, it's small. Here, I'll get one. Hmm. So um, I'm working with the same publisher that I worked with for my first book, and my first book was really meant for florists or yeah people who were like really interested in wearable flowers and wanted some step by step technique. Um, Mm -hmm. But when the publisher reached out about this idea, they had an idea to write a book that would kind of welcome um, anyone who's interested in flowers to kind of, you know, participate in floristry a little bit more. And so I loved the idea, but we had to go back and forth quite a bit on like what would actually be in the book. Um, Right. And for purposes of keeping like every, like the cost low and, um, just making it really accessible. We decided not to do step by step. I have to tell you, step by step is incredibly <laughs> lab- it's time consuming. Oh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you have to do every project like four times. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, um, it's not a step by step, but I wanted um, to put some front matter in that would kind of walk people through, um, you know, acquainting themselves with technique and care handling and, um, you know, some background on floristry so that they could kind of jump in and start, yeah, like designing more often for themselves Mm -hmm. or, you know, their friends and so on. 
So I'm hoping the book welcomes novice novices. That's kind of who it's for, but interesting enough or curiosity peaking enough to entertain, you know, nerdy florists like us. And yeah, um, I, I have to commend you. There's a certain chapter I'm going to interrupt and just say, you're right. Yes, um, it is like it's very geared towards everyone. But the chapter in here on flowers for me, mm -hmm. I was like, this is so good because how often you guys, how often do we actually do our selves a favor? And I mean, I, I had to bring, I'm like, okay, we're doing some aromatherapy. Yeah. It's here. <laughs> but she goes, you, you went through and you believe like beautifully just little projects. They're not even like something that would take you mm -hmm. an hour. Like you could just take some of your leftover flowers and put them in a nice little, you know, meditation. But I yeah. just thought that was great. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. I felt a little, well, a lot self-conscious when it was finally out in the world because then people examine it and they look through it and you're, mm -hmm. you can't please everyone. You can't have one book that meets everyone where they are. So right. yeah, it's really like the title is what, I chose the title on purpose to kind of drive the point home that flowers are for everyone to enjoy. And it doesn't have to be this kind of, you know, elitist or classist, you know, right. expensive um, endeavor. It can be super simple. And, you know, there's something natural, like everybody has access to something. Yeah. No, that's so true. And I think that you really, you really portrayed that. Oh, well, very good. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm going to have to grow. I'm going to have to start growing more vegetables. I really, I really enjoyed the vegetables in there too. It's really fun. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been done before, but it's just so like, I don't know when you see it again, you're like, Oh yeah, I should totally grow those tomatoes that I wanted to like throw in the ground. And I never did. Right. So, but yeah, like, the, like I said, you can use literally anything. You can go on a walk and find some stuff on the side of the road. It's yeah. not that hard. <laughs> For a party in October, just, for example, I, um, you know how like on the side of the road be in the crack between the pavement and the sidewalk start. Yeah. There's like a line in the fall of like amber grasses and they're beautiful. They're like, it's total crap, but it's like, you know, like kind of mulberry co colored, um, grasses in seed and then little like golden tufty grasses. And there's just this mix. I went out to a, a abandoned parking lot and, shoveled up did you get it all out You're yeah like, <laughs> like in a perfect time you know i love that yeah and so i made like uh like a like a runner for this fall party just with that i mean it's nobody cares if you take it you know it's free and mm -hmm. overlooked um but it's beautiful like it's those pauses you know that i think really fill a lifetime with interest, you know, like yeah. pausing enough to look down and say that, you know, line of junk plants is actually very beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And I think you really gave people the reminder to do that. So that's, it's, I like it. I really do. I think it's a great, thank you. Great addition. Very good. Thanks. And it's pocket size. You can just. Exactly. It's very cute. I like <laughs> it. And the photography is beautiful. You guys did a really good job with it. Thank you. It's very nice. Thanks. How is the process? How is it? I feel like this one's a lot more, um, a lot more words involved, a lot more writing probably for this one than there was for um, the other one. Well, there was more of everything for the other one. Um, there was mm -hmm. quite a bit of front matter and then the step-by-step -step took quite a bit. Um, yeah. I enjoyed writing this one. Um, the photography, like with both books is hard because I don't know if you're like me, all the good things happen when nobody's around. Like yeah. the magic, the perfect elements, the light. <laughs> Your mood is calmer when you're not under pressure. It, I'm speaking for myself now. I don't know about you. I work mm -hmm. not very well under pressure. So both books, the only downside is that you're constantly under this time schedule and you have to yeah. form in a certain, you know, pattern. And it's just hard, you know? So you don't, so you end up like making this thing that you're equally proud of and like cringing over because you know so many good moments that were better 
mm-hmm. never were captured. Like it's- those are things you're going to hold inside of you. Yeah. Like nobody else is going to know that I had to get over that really quick too, because it's one of those things like, you know, you go and you do this event and you're like, God, I had a crappy day. I had a really bad experience. It wasn't good. So then I don't share any of the photos. Right. Cause I'm like, Oh, like that was not a good day. And, uh, and, and, Mm-hmm. And then you'll share one of them and people go nuts for it. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I feel like some time also helps, you know, because the mm-hmm. like you, there's this flurry of activity to get everything done and then yeah. you send it all off and you don't see it again for a year. So yeah. time for you to like calm down. And then when you get it back, you're usually like, oh, okay. Like I don't suck that bad, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so there definitely is that. But um, as, because like, I know that the good things happen when no one's around. I'm learning photography now. Not good. Not that I don't enjoy working with photographers. It's just that my own personality, I need, I need eight Mm -hmm. hours to capture one idea. Like I just tweak it. I need, so if I can have the photography knowledge too, then like more equipped to be able to capture the good stuff. What are you shooting on? What are you Uh, playing with right now? I got a Sony A7R. Nice. Yeah. And I only have one lens right now. I think I ended up with the 50 millimeter. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not, I, I have to like walk into the other room to get far enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, yeah, a closer one. Now. Yeah. So I need, I'm going to have to get another lens already. And I have a ton to learn. Like I do not. It's a very large learning curve. I, I tried a little bit. I dabbled with it. I was like, you know, I don't, yeah, I just, I'll just pick that up later. It's, it's one of those things, you know, when you need it, it's very, very handy. And like you said, if you're in the studio and you're trying to shoot something and you need that, just time to yourself, honestly, sometimes it's, it's probably a little bit better than having to work on somebody else's timeline, which is hard when you work with photographers. Super hard. Yeah. And it's almost comical with the first book. I had so many things, like random things that happened that destroyed my work. Like I had, um, we had a heat wave and oh no, my air conditioning died. And like all these beautiful things that I had like coaxed to perfection were just all just like mushy and dead, you know, just things happen and you, and you have to, yep group and it's do. uncomfortable and you're rushing. And so, yeah, but it's worth yeah. it. Totally worth it. I feel like these are little love letters to floristry that I, you know, can give and have something um, tangible to leave. Mm-hmm. Good. That's good. It's really, you know, it's a long process and yeah. um, I commend you. It's a really good, uh, it's a good, it's a good piece. Very nice. Yeah, I'm grateful that I got the chance, so for sure. Yeah. Are you going to continue with, are there works for another one coming? You have something in mind? Um, I know we're not supposed to say anything. I but... have a lot of writing in mind, and I've been mm-hmm. blogging more and collecting, like, good snippets of thoughts and things, mostly about the industry and, like, like kind of standing up for it, you know? Yeah. Um, but I don't know how to translate that into the next theme for a book yet. Uh, I think it'll come. Yeah, it'll come. Yeah. As long as you keep working that muscle, it'll, it'll, it'll work itself out. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, like, we need those advocates in this industry. It's, it's, uh, it's been an interesting couple of years. Like, yeah, it has. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And I feel like a lot uh, a lot of the stuff that we used to do is just, we don't gravitate it as much anymore. I mean, we can definitely talk about education as far as that goes. I know you are all for it, especially with you going for your international masters, um, which I'm so excited for you guys. That's going to be so much fun. Thank you. Um, but how, how has your view kind of changed over time? Oh. What, what was the journey for you? Uh, so much. Um, I guess, I guess I have to start from the start, you know? So, okay. Yeah. When I found floristry, I think like most people, I didn't plan to be a florist. It, it kind of was introduced. I think it gets you. It gets you. Yeah. It, it sells you. Yeah. Um, so, 
at the time I was making jewelry for friends and friends started to get married. I started making jewelry for them and their bridesmaids. And one of my clients, uh, friend clients asked me to do her flowers. And so I agreed to do her flowers and I gifted them to her because I had no idea what I was doing. And she paid for, you know, all the costs or whatever. And so when I was designing her flowers, like I instantly connected with it. I thought, oh my gosh, I love this so much. Um, because you're kind of like, I love cooking too. I was studying to be a chef. Yeah, same. Yeah. So <laughs> it, like you get the adrenaline, you get, you get that, like, um, everything has to be perfect. And I love that, that kind of, um, framework where you, you're making something that has to be perfect. You have one shot and it's all natural materials. It just like wove together a lot of interest for me you know, like fashion, entertaining, um, interior design, like all of these things that I've always been fascinated by. So I recognized right away, like, this is a very cool profession. Mm -hmm. I started telling people, friends, family, um, I almost got like teased about it. Like, like, because Mm -hmm. I, I was so serious. I'm like, I want to be a florist and I have to find, you know, someone to apprentice with. And people were like, you know, you don't, you just go to the corner flower shop and get a job. Like it's not that, deep, you know? <laughs> and so some people teased me. Some people were like, oh my gosh, you're never going to like make any money or find, you know, anybody to work with around here. Like there's no opportunity. I had the same problem. Yeah. So there was like a obvious cultural opinion about what floristry is. I think there's still, there still is. Totally. It's, it's, uh, it's going to be a hard one to break. I don't know how we're going to do it, but you know, all these chefs get this notoriety and I was watching that Netflix show. I forget, I forget the name of it, but it's the one where they follow the chefs around. Chef's Table? Yes. That was it. Love that show. Yeah. Um, cause we're going to dinner in Chicago in some, it, in July. Mm-hmm. Um, Ana Heat and I are planning and Ursula, if you would like to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wanna, but anyways, I'm like, how do they get this notoriety? Like, I even said that to my husband. I'm like, this show is sexy. Like they made this look good. It's beautiful. And then we get stuck with these game show type shows. Like, yeah, it's not a real profession. These people don't actually do art. Like, mm, mm-hmm. I can't, I just, I'm like, man, we have got to step up. I think we are. I think we're on the way. I think about the the similarities between us and chefs a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think we, it's a very like direct correlation. Very, very similar. Yeah. So I do think we're on on our way and I I would love to see a chef's table for florists. I think it would be an incredible, beautiful show. Yeah. Yeah. Meaningful, like as meaningful as the chef's story. So, but there's just so much opportunity there to make a really gorgeous production. And it's, you know, what we got wasn't really, I mean, it, those, those shows that were, they were good, they were entertaining, but I just, I would like to see something not game show. Yeah. You know, totally. Yeah. Not a competition, like a artist introspective profile. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I know. Um, yeah. So I recognize that like this was an amazing profession, super artful. I was completely obsessed from the beginning. I saw it had value, but then like the cultural opinion was like really crappy. (laughs) So um, I started to kind of like, like, like put like maybe a chip on my shoulder a little bit, like to prove that floristry is, you know, an art as valuable as, you know, like, you know, sculpture and painting and so on. Um, But I floundered a little bit because the education at the time that was out there was very conventional and traditional yeah. um, and limiting. So I, I don't want to devalue this experience, but I went to the Michigan Floral Association and got my certification and I did learn a lot. Like I learned um, a long list of nomenclature and like care and handling and tools and techniques and like the geometric forms, um, wiring, things like that. But unless you're super obsessed with floristry and you're curious and you're willing to like keep going, the information Mm -hmm. that was handed to us was very dated, like extremely limiting. Um, Yeah. You didn't learn anything about like natural armatures or the history of floristry or, you know, alternative mechanics to foam. Um, It was very Mm -hmm. little tiny box. It's very 
Yep. Cookie cutter. Here you go. This is your basic floristry class. Right. And so from there, yeah. you know, that track, getting that certification, then one, if they want to continue, is supposed to test for AIFD, which again, like I respect and admire people who do get that certification. However, it's not really a teaching certification. No. I was looking for someone to, to like, I wanted to crack my head open and like learn everything. Yeah. Shove everything in. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to know how to make floral art, you know, mm-hmm. artful, relevant, um, natural floristry. So I did go through the testing process in 2011 and I didn't test high enough to be inducted. Um, and I left with a bitter kind of taste in my mouth about the whole process because, sorry. That's okay. Because again, I was looking for knowledge and I yeah. was finding it. I was finding, I found a test where people who already knew the things I wanted to know were going and testing and I've kind of felt out of place. So again, it's like a great thing to do to, te- to stretch yourself, but it's not like a educational program necessarily. Yeah. Um, so then I started to like pay attention, like around that time, there was more and more workshops and things happening. And I started to see that there was opportunities to study with people that I'd been admiring, um, mm-hmm. people really that I'd seen in magazines like Martha Stewart and other, yeah. you know, like, um, who was hot at the time? Um, Matt, Matthew. Oh, my head, my head. Matthew. Matthew. Oh, he's a little cute, curly guy in New York. Like a bunch of New York designers, you know, who were doing big. Yeah, New York. Yeah, New York was very hot that yeah. time frame. Yeah. Um, his name will come to me. Well, <laughs> I can picture his face. Anyway, at the time, um, like Lewis Miller and there was just this group of like New York florists that were doing very artful, painterly, very natural um, floristry that I loved. Because it was like in... in deep contrast to like the really kind of tight contrived, um, you know, geometric uniform style that I didn't gravitate towards. I didn't understand it as much. So it was in, you know, it was like a real contrast. So I was really attracted to that. So I started to kind of go in that angle. Um, and the value I found from going to those workshops was more, Like it was more like representation of what's possible than giving me tools to recreate the work, you know, like I went and I thought these people are very artful. They definitely have an eye for design and proportion and they're capturing like the essence of the natural medium in a beautiful way. However, again, I found myself sitting in the chair thinking like, well, what do I do? Like, I go back to my studio. But how? <laughs> I go back to my studio and I try to make this, you know, artful crescent-shaped compo, and I have no step-by-step um, structure mm-hmm. framework to be able to recreate the work because I think the people at the time that were getting the stage weren't um, weren't necessarily devoted to like illuminating their process Mm -hmm. so that the people sitting in the chairs can go back to their studios and also create with like this, this, like, we talked about this before the language barrier. Right. Right. So I, I kind of like just was flopping around, like trying to figure out like, where do I get this information? And Mm -hmm. it occurred to me that there's no one answer, you know, there's people you admire for different reasons. And you can learn a ton from someone whose work is not relevant to you at all. Yeah. You can learn from everybody. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's my take on it. Right. So backing up like that New York set at the time, I was really kind of um, trying to champion them because I saw that they had the potential to kind of break out of that florist framework. Mm-hmm. And they were like the rebels of the time. I do remember this. Totally. Yeah. But they got the attention of like the New York Times and they were in like mm-hmm. New York magazine and they were um, 
you know, getting big jobs and like doing cool things at the Met. And like you saw all these things happening, these like significant cultural things happening. And you could see there was kind of this movement starting where people were mm-hmm. on the floor street in a different way. So yep. I felt kind of defensive of them, even though I wasn't learning much from them, which was disappointing. I felt kind of defensive. Like, no, this is the set that's going to like, you know, yeah. push floor street forward or whatever. Uh, I think I remember us having this conversation yeah. in New York. We, We had just got done watching um, a very wonderful presentation, and it was the style you're talking about. Um, But I came out of it from a different point of view. I I came out of it as I couldn't listen or understand anything they were saying. Right. It It wasn't like they were... It was like literally they were speaking English, but they were speaking a different language. And... It was because they didn't have a unified education on right. design. I mean, they were pulling words that didn't fit what they were describing. Yeah. And that was really hard for me because we learn, um, I don't know if I learned it in AIFD, but in my preparation for AIFD and being part of part of that, there's this language that all artists should speak. And it's, it's not, you know, it's not making a, a confined little traditional group of it, but it's it's everything like, uh, you know, fashion design. Um, just every type of art should have a language. And that's basically what AIFD does. They give you that language mm-hmm. if you absorb that. Um, but even further, I mean, the other classes I've taken, mm-hmm. we speak that language. And they didn't have the verbal part right there. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I feel like I owe you other people an apology because I was kind of obnoxious about promoting these people as like the most relevant at the time. But they were, they really were. And I, I mean, they were really breaking out what we have now. And I, and I, appreciate what they were doing. I just wished that they had a little better presenting skills of it. Um, Maybe more communication would have been helpful. Like you said, they weren't really showing you the how or the why of why you like, there's a, there's a designer that can naturally design something beautiful, but do they know how to describe it? Right. Do they know how to recreate that or teach it? That's the, that's the barrier. Right. Yeah. And so some, like looking back, some people, I don't think they were interested in illuminating, illuminating their process. I don't think they no. even thought that was valuable. Like they were just there to sh- kind of show their stuff. Um, mm-hmm. I felt that vibe from some. And then from others, I feel like they do have like a teacher's spirit. However, they don't have the language like you say. Um, yeah. So I left kind of not really understanding that that was a real problem until I started to teach myself. And so right. <laughs> and I'm the one on the stage and there's people in the chairs and that dynamic shift is huge, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, I really, because I guess going back to how I felt that floristry wasn't being repped, Currently, I felt like a strong pull to try my best in my own way to um, represent forestry in in a in the best way possible. You know, so learning the art principles that apply in order to be able to not only make my process make sense or feel better for my own self, but to be able to articulate it to hungry students who are starting out, who are feeling really frustrated that they can't make the thing that they can imagine in their head. Because I was that person too. I went back to my studio and I felt, I felt like there's these cool kids here and I'm just not cool enough because I can't do what they're doing. The missing piece is they didn't articulate their process so that I could go to my studio with those art principles digested and then do my own thing and have some framework to be able to 
construct things that I want to make. That's it. It's missing information. Yeah. And over the years, like, man, I've had so many, like, I, I ended up writing a whole blog post about it because there's been so many experiences that I know are not, the people aren't being malicious, but it's like, I just, uh, there's like, you just want everything to come together in a way that represents floristry best. Yeah. Yep. I'm on the same page. I understand. And it, it also, it makes being an educator, like if you're a responsible educator, yeah, you will take the time to make sure you're giving those students what they need to be successful. Yeah. Rather than just bluntly saying, well, I don't really believe in the principles and elements, but here's how you do it. And, you know, this is my stuff. Like here it is on the stage. It looks pretty, but is it functional? Like, is it recreatable? Can you uh, explain why it touches on the points that we love to see? Like, right. No? Yeah. It's yeah. Um, a lack of awareness, you know, mm-hmm. that, yeah, it is valuable. It's, it's a nice experience to sit in the chair and just watch someone design something beautiful. But it's even better if you can walk away with new information that allows you to like show yourself as an artist. Like for me now, that is my complete focus. Like if it's not helpful for someone, if it's not going to lead them through a better process or not pique curiosity or not answer some question for them, then what am I doing it for? I'm just like stroking myself, you know? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, it's ego. <laughs> we uh, we all have that little, you know, oh, my stuff got featured. Oh, like, it's so good. It's it's purely ego. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes we do have to do that. But the people that do it all the time, you can tell. You can just tell. Yeah. So I love people like Hitomi and, and Gregor. It is so, it's blatantly obvious that they are there to um, make things that it's an offering, you know, it's an offering to the people in the room. It's not about them. They are, it's just a beautiful thing to watch. A teacher who is completely focused on offering information that will help the student, that will benefit the student. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Good. I I mean, like, it's, it's really refreshing to to have educators that do that. I, I, you know, there's so many people who just fluff around the facts and, you know, you don't get anything out of it. Yeah. So having somebody that actually teaches and it, it shouldn't be gatekept knowledge. It shouldn't be No. like, you're not going to run out of it. There's so many ways to make this art. Like, I don't understand that mentality at all. <laughs> no, there's, there's so many ways that will never be actualized. And I, yeah, more you, the more you share ideas, the more ideas flow into you. And it's just like this, like, that's how you get into flow. If you hold it, yeah. hold on to stuff and you're defensive over your ideas. I mean, I feel like the creative flow just really stops. It stops. Yeah, it really yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah. I had another thought. Oh, Matthew Robbins. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> It it was coming someday. Yeah. Yeah. And not everybody like, okay, getting back to the teaching thing, like not everybody will be able to recall the principles of design or be able to talk about the golden ratio in an articulate way or be able to like, remember all of the, you know, the correct. I still have to go back and look every now and then I'm like, wait, what elements was I, what was I thinking? (laughs) Right. Yeah. Especially if you start to do like EMC and IMF, like there's, other terms and there's more complex ways of thinking and Mm -hmm. you're not going to remember all of that stuff. But I still think even without absorbing the art principles, you can still be a functional teacher as long as you eliminate your process. Like I start with branches because they're the largest stem and I want to get those in first. And then I put in my line flowers to hug the lines I've created with the branches. And then I do this. Then I do that. You know, like I don't want... Mm -hmm to like finger wag and say like, you have to have this certain education to be a a functional teacher. I just think that it's super important to just 
share your process at minimum. I think it just, it comes down to being responsible. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, you know, finger wagging or anything like that. But if you are not, if you're not actually able to verbalize what you're trying to teach, it's right. It's a problem. And I think also being an educator, you want to get that knowledge. You want to be able you to say. speak to your students in a way that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's minimum. And then there's another kind of thing I think about, which is if we're ever going to elevate ourselves as like an art form, we have to convince the public that we are responding to art principles or using art principles in our work, you know? Mm -hmm. So to be able to convince the larger culture that we have something that's not just this kind of flimsy um, hobby, you know, we have to be able to like talk the talk. Yeah. 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 And I think that's drawing a lot more people towards European certifications too. Yeah. Honestly, I think, I think we're seeing a rise in that, which I love. I think that's amazing. Um, yeah. I, I wish there was more capacity for people to get that mainstream. Yeah. Um, you know, it's expensive, but it's worth it. Oh, Extremely right. worth it. Oh yeah. I mean, I've wanted to do something like this for almost 20 years. I just, I didn't think I could afford it. I didn't really have the confidence to like get a loan to, to do it, you know, but looking back, like if I had started in that way, I can't even imagine, you know, ah, would have been really a different journey, but I like the journey that I went on. I just kind of made a fool of myself a lot along the way. <laughs> that's part of growing though, honestly. And I don't think you made a, no, well, you didn't. And that's, it was your journey and that was important to, <laughs> for where you are right now. Yeah. It's, it's necessary. I mean, I look back at the stuff that I used to do and I'm like, Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm glad that social media wasn't around until 20. Well, I didn't really latch on to it until like 2013. Yeah. Yeah. Because the stuff I was making is, was, um, mm -hmm. I came across some of my old portfolios and I'm like, Ooh, that's going in the garden. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Really wow. Yep. Yeah. So it's all fascinating. Um, I could share a link to that blog post if you want. Yes, please do. Cause I read it already. Um, but it is a very good insight on everything we just kind of talked about and touched on plus a whole lot more. There's yeah. so much good stuff in that article. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So good way to get all of this out, you know, and then <clears throat> I'm thinking about, well, how do we elevate floristry, you know, and like reach the larger culture and convince them that, we are artists. Like those are the things I'm kind of thinking about. That's like one of my driving motivations to pique the, mm -hmm. the public's curiosity about what we do. So yeah. Yeah. It's all in the how to's. I don't know. That's another one. I'm just like, you know, that's a, it's a big weight to, to carry, but hopefully, I mean, like, I think it's getting there. Honestly, people are really gravitating towards, um, you know, the healing properties just alone with what we do mm -hmm. emotionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think we're seeing a lot of um, like opportunities for florists that maybe we haven't seen before, you know, like brand collaborations and yes, you know, yeah. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Cause I know you're, um, you're a collab with Fris Fiskers, right? Yeah. So I've had a brand collaboration with Fiskers for some time now. And I love that these kind of larger companies are interested in what florists do and can see that it's interesting to their, you know, market. Their, yeah. Thank you. That word was escaping me. Yeah. So um, it'll continue and they, they like the how to's. So I create little projects that sometimes they're weird floral art projects. Sometimes they're really super approachable for, um, mm -hmm. you know, that the flower enthusiast who might just garden a little bit and want to make something interesting so yeah, that'll continue. And then you know, I'm always open to other ones, but for me, they really have to be floral related. I don't, I'm not really interested in like doing sunglasses or, you know. <laughs> well, that's another part about being a, a responsible teacher. I mean, don't go picking things just because you get a good affiliate commission. Like make sure it aligns up and supports your brands and they respect you and yeah. all of that. And I love Fiskars. They're a really cool company. They're like, they have um, 
really great like brand <laughs> core values, you know, they uh, okay. are big with sustainability and they support like social justice uh, initiatives. So yeah, I just like them too. So that feels better. You know, you don't yeah. be like just partnering with anyone. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I don't know. I feel like uh, in the next year, few years, I think that's going to be more of a thing. You do see a lot more floors collaborating. And, you know, I, I think we probably need to start talking about what these collaborations mean for our industry and how to approach them. Because I don't think a lot of people understand how to price that or ask for money on that or make sure they're getting paid enough. Totally. Yeah. So I looked it up and there is kind of this metric. Like if you have a certain amount of followers, then you yes. are able to ask for a certain amount per post or story. Um, mm -hmm. so I kind of use that as a, as a framework. And then I reached out to other people that I saw that were already collaborating with brands and kind of asked them what they were doing. And I got a lot of different answers. I think it's a little bit of a renegade scenario where, you know, people just ask for what they think their posts are worth. Sure. I don't know. I mean, I've, I've like purposely tried to build a following because I didn't have a retail store where people could like walk in. So it was important for me to be really consistent and like build an organic following. So I do recognize that I've put a ton of work and time into that. But yeah, you have. I have. But you can see it with you. Your quality of your posts is very high. And I don't think you put anything out just as filler. Mm -hmm. So it really helps kind of um, emphasize that you're a good collaborator. So mm -hmm. you've been, you know, I'll, I watch all this Fisker stuff and I'm just like, yeah, that's a really good, like, I hope they're paying her good because that's a good, <laughs> that's a good marketing Thing. video right there, you know? Yeah. So I, I put a lot of effort into that and I recognize that my number is good, but at the same time I see, like I use Instagram as like a free content kind of portal. Like I'm not going to do the paid subscription thing where, yeah, yeah, I feel that it's this unique place where you can offer free information and bring people like welcome people in. So mm -hmm. Yeah. It again, goes with the gatekeeping. There is so much you can just give to people, and that's a really good platform to do it on because it supports so many formats. So, yeah, I don't see why people. I, I understand, you know, maybe putting a membership on there or whatever if they're not going to do anything else. But mm -hmm. you have the website, you have the classes, and all of that. So there's no reason to not put it out there for free. Yeah. As far as the Instagram goes, <laughs> the courses and stuff, I, you know, yeah. those are definitely. Yeah. It makes me feel good to have a free resource. So that's how I view it. And I enjoy it. Like some people hate posting and hate social media and I've always enjoyed it. So it doesn't feel like this big labor, you know, thanks. That's kind of the, the major feedback I got when we did our, our program um, was the time like we were able to put polls out to to people that were coming to the symposium and it was time it was like people just don't have time and I mean I, I get that mm -hmm. but um at the same time I think you have to kind of flip the switch on it a little bit and make it a creative outlet instead totally um yeah it'll so it helps <laughs> yeah. like I think anything that you don't enjoy feels really time consuming and if you do enjoy it it's less or it, the time it takes doesn't feel like a burden Right. Yeah. You have to make friends with it or don't. <laughs> Some people, you know, for their business, it doesn't make that big of a difference. Like when I was a wedding florist and exclusively designing for clients in my area, it didn't matter as much at all. I think it's changed though. Like, cause for me, I have the two accounts. I have one for this kind of stuff and I have, which is small still like we're, we're growing. Yeah. I don't put as much effort into that one because at uh, time, <laughs> uh, but my wedding, my wedding one and you know, the basic retail stuff that I do, it's, um, it's actually a really great platform for getting a visual representation of my work yep. and attracting local brides and all of the, our, you know, just couples in general, not just brides, but yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, it's changed. I don't want to discount the value, but I feel like, people feel this pressure to get this big number or to spend all this time on Instagram when 
their business model might not even, you know, need yeah. an effort. You know, you, you mm -hmm. kind of have a portfolio that people can access and like check you out and make sure they want to work with you or whatever, or share ideas or what have you share upcoming events and so on. But if you're, if your clientele is in your area, I feel like word of mouth is still yeah. more powerful in many ways than social media. But for me, like to be able to talk to people everywhere, cause I'm doing online classes, I have to put more yes. to it because I'm not talking to people in my town at all. <laughs> like, yeah, it really just depends on your market. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So know your market. If it works for you, put effort into it. If not, yeah. Maybe, maybe network, join a networking group in your local area. Totally. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. I think so too. Yes. Cause people feel bad about the number thing. The numbers are just going to be different depending like what your business is. Like. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't, I don't put a lot of faith in the numbers, honestly, because I know that there are a lot of people out there who have bought their followers or been on there since forever and a day when it was still okay to buy followers. And, and, it's the trick is I think also with collaborations, they look more on your engagement than they do your numbers anymore. So the number thing, it's all, and I feel like the florists are still really stuck on the numbers because we're like probably two or three years behind the rest of the world with technology, which is so sad, Yeah, <laughs> but they still really care about the numbers. And I, I've had really, really high end florists, um, big name florists who are like, no, we're going to pick that person to do our, our, you know, presentation because they have high numbers. And I'm like, it's still happening. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's, it, it is still happening. I, I hope that we start to come to the conclusion that high numbers don't equal engagement mm -hmm. or, you know, selling products. I know, you know, for a fact, there are people who have like upwards of, 20, 50,000 followers and they're, they're not selling anything. No, no, it's not a guarantee of selling anything tangible. I'll tell you that. Um, yeah. Working on your email list and that, yeah, yeah, out and talking to people like that will get you some traction. But even, <clears throat> you know, my numbers, you would think that maybe 1% of my people would buy something. It's not even 1% <laughs> of my following will buy something. And yeah, how are you know, how are you even to know like maybe some of them are robots? Yeah, and people don't realize that kind of stuff. Like some of those aren't even real people. <laughs> yeah. You never know. <laughs> the buying followers thing, I when I see an account that I follow that looks like they're doing that, I unfollow them because I'm so scared of getting some weird virus or scam <laughs> shadow ban thing. Yeah, I know. Follow them. And I recently unfollowed someone who's super prominent, who it's obvious they bought followers because you just, you could, yeah, you, you can off. tell, you can tell, like you look at the amount of likes on a post, like, like they, some people do boost their posts, which I get. Sure. If you have money, you didn't buy a coffee that day. Sure. Boost your post, whatever. Yeah. Um, but you can tell, like, if you look at the number of followers and they have, like, two comments and three of them are bots commenting, it, it, like, right. <laughs> on the, yeah, on a static picture, like, no, <laughs> mm -mm. I can't. I have to, I have to unfollow you. I'm sorry and protect myself. <laughs> <laughs> if you're like, eh, yeah, like virus, like, no, no, you cough over there. <laughs> I'm scared of you. <laughs> Are there any other platforms that you're going to be thinking of adding in the near future? Are you going to start doing anything on YouTube or any other? You don't do TikTok. Do you do TikTok? TikTok I don't know. Terrifies me. Um, no, I'm too old and too slow for TikTok. I don't. Yeah, I. It's not my favorite. Honestly, I throw stuff on there, but it's not. Mm -hmm. It's not my favorite. Um, YouTube. I think Instagram will be around for a while. YouTube is definitely sticking around for sure. Yeah. So been on my list for a really long time. Um, I'm just, I just haven't gotten it together to work on my channel. I do have a channel. I haven't done anything with it besides put a few videos up. Um, but I can see its value for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's another one that if you think about it long term, mm -hmm. it's also a really good place to get collaborations mm -hmm. and um, affiliates. And, <laughs> I mean, it's just a, it's, 
it's a very long term platform. Mm -hmm. Um, your stuff can stick around on there for years. So yeah, rather than Instagram, where it's like you get, I don't, I think it's maybe the top. Right now, the metrics are like a post gets seen for maybe three ish days. Mm -hmm. I think I don't remember what the metrics are right now, but it's short. You're like your window of opportunity on your posts are very short. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I will be focused on YouTube at some point. I want to. Yeah. Cool. Well, if you ever need any help or chat or thank you, anything like that. All right. Well, how are you feeling? Anything else you want to talk about? We've been going for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think this was a conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, we covered some, we could totally call it. Yeah. We covered a lot. <laughs> I think we're probably full, but I do want to mention, uh, the book, of course, uh, actually, how about if you go ahead and promote whatever you want to promote? Okay. Um, talk about the book, anything, Yeah. anything upcoming. Thank you. Yeah. I have a few things going on. I have the new book, of course I have, um, a link to different booksellers in my profile on Instagram or at my website, susanmccleary.com. And you can find a local bookseller um, where you can buy it. I have a virtual studio membership that functions kind of like a gym membership. So it's a new, Yay. yeah, it's a new class every month and a live either expert session or Q and a se session every month and lots of little bonuses and things um, tucked in there. I've had that for almost five years now. Wow. That's yeah. impressive. Yeah. Is that on your website then? Yeah. Yeah. So that's okay. Cool. Too. And we are um, reopening admission to that um, between March 6th and 10th. And that might go on a little bit longer than the 10th. But anyway, we closed membership because um, to kind of regroup and like welcome people in, in one chunk instead of like welcoming people uh, all the time every other day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it just makes it more manageable. Yeah. That's a really great group that I'm really proud of. There's a ton of ideas in there and they're all, they're all meant to like boost you up so you can do the best work possible and like relevant current um, fixes for mostly event florists, but mm -hmm. um, there's a lot in there for retail florists too. And just flower lovers. That's the virtual cool. studio. Um, and then I have standalone classes that are just kind of all the part classes that I've been adding over the years. And those are all on my website as well. Um, and yeah, the workshops, if you join my newsletter, you'll get regular, um, notifications of upcoming events. Um, you'll get notifications of my new blog posts, um, news of just interesting floral happenings. And so, yeah, everything's on my website. Cool. Yeah. The newsletter is a very good resource, you guys. So make sure you sign up for that. Um, check out everything else she's got going on. It, it's, it's amazing to see. I, I feel like I've known you for a very long time and it's just so cool to see how people grow over the years. So yeah. Thank you. Awesome. And Brian, here's the book again. <laughs> so that's the new baby and um, we'll definitely be kind of doing a giveaway. So I'll announce that uh, it'll probably be in the description. So make sure you read the description on this um, wherever I post it. Sounds great. Cool. Thanks. All right. Well, we'll chat soon. Okay. Um, I hope to see you in person in July. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe before then, but good luck in March. Thank you. Um, you're going to do amazing. Thank you.